Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Andrew Carr. I'm the editor of the Centre of Gravity series produced by the Strategic and Defence Study Centre. I'd like to thank you all very much for coming along today. Hopefully today is going to be a very interesting and exciting presentation. And I use that word deliberately because our host is known as perhaps a little bit of a, a controversialist in Australian foreign policy. You may have heard of his name a few times before. I'm just kind of guessing by your presence here. Um, when we started the Centre of Gravity series, which we're aiming to produce for a policy audience and an engaged public audience, um, you know, with specific policy recommendations, with an engagement with the big kind of contemporary security questions that are facing our country and our region at the moment, we had a sense, almost an inevitable sense, that Professor White would write for our series. And it wasn't just for the old, well, because he's part of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. In fact, you'll find, hopefully over the coming years, that SDSC members will actually be a minority of those who write for our series. Our aim is to bring in the best voices from around the world to address some of these issues, to bring in some fresh and interesting voices. But we knew that Professor White would be I inevitably and ideally one of our key authors early on. And the reason for this is that in envisaging such a series, there was really no other person in, in the Australian public debate who so encapsulates that mix of political background in terms of a, a kind of policy role advising a prime minister, media background um, with his work in the press gallery, uh, strong academic role in terms of head of SDSC, and the kind of wider media engagement. Um, Professor White is really one of those people who needs no introductions, and all done you know, when debating some, some very kind of difficult, controversial questions, all done with a kind of smiley disposition, which makes his writing very easy to engage with uh, and pleasant to debate with. Um, so enough from me. Uh, you've come along to hear Professor White talking about Australia and Japan and whether there should be an alliance. As I said, this is the number four paper of the Centre of Gravity series. Um, we have other papers up on our website, um, which you can easily find by Googling us. We also have an email distribution list um, and also a, con a copy of um, Professor Paul Dibbs' uh, Centre of Gravity paper on Australia's uh, kind of submarine capability and how it fits with Australian grand strategy. So if you haven't picked up a copy, they're just down here at the front. So without further ado, can I introduce Professor Hugh White. Well, is that yours? Well, thank you all for coming and thank you, Andrew, for that very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and nice to see uh, a lot of old friends in, uh, in the audience. Um, and I also just want to uh, congratulate Andrew and Brendan on the Centre of Gravity paper idea. I think it's a terrific idea and I think it's uh, very well conceived and very well executed. Uh, and uh, great to see that it's taken off uh, so well. Great to see Paul in the series. I'd be I'm sure there's a lot we'd like to debate about, both your paper and mine, mate, but anyway, we'll come to that. And, and uh, as I say, thanks all for coming. What I want to do today is talk about um, what seems to be one of the most interesting new ideas in Australian strategic policy for a very long time. And that's not a very high bar to get over, mind you, because new ideas are not very common in Australian strategic policy. We tend to get one about once every 40 years and stick to it. Um, but there is a new idea around at the moment. I think a very significant new idea. And it is that we should build a very close defence relationship and indeed even an alliance, and exactly what I mean by that phrase I'll come back to in a, little, in a little while, with Japan. This is pretty significant in several dimensions. One point obviously is that Australia has been in the business of building defence relationships in our region for a very long time, and particularly since the Second World War, right at the heart of one of the key elements of Australian strategic policy considered in abroad has been to build a very strong set of defence relationships with countries in our closer neighbourhood, and particularly with South, in Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific. Um, and in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, the, the, the development of these relationships 
was an absolutely central part of what Australia did in the strategic policy space. I think the historians will judge actually that in the mid 1990s perhaps, the focus on Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific started to sag a little, to slow down a little. And the focus and interest and attention in Northeast Asia and later in, in South Asia um, started to pick up. Um, but I think right now, if you look at you know, what's Australia's most interesting, fastest growing, fastest developing defence relationship today? There's nothing in Southeast Asia. Nothing very much has happened in any of the defence relationships in Southeast Asia in the last decade or so, as far as I can see. It is clearly the relationship with Japan. And this is quite overt in Australian government policy, and I'll touch on some of that in a minute, but it's also, I think, perhaps more significantly, become part of the conversation in people who are interested in strategic policy in this town, that the relationship with Japan is going fast and it's got a long way to go and that there is serious consideration being given to whether or not this should not become an alliance. And by alliance I mean a real alliance. That is an Article 4 kind of alliance. An act to meet the common danger in accordance with our constitutional processes kind of alliance. An alliance that really commits the two countries to a very deep strategic partnership indeed. My impression is that expectations that such an alliance are a possibility at least in the relationship are being raised by Canberra, whether intentionally or not or how intentionally I'm not quite sure, in Tokyo, in Washington and in Beijing as well as elsewhere in the region. And that this is happening, I would argue, at a moment in, in, in the strategic history of Australia's region our strategic environment, which is unusually fluid. And in that very fluid strategic environment, this idea has very complex implications, which go well beyond the kind of natural thought that Japan's a nice country and it would be nice to get closer to it. Those implications have not been debated at all in public in Australia. And I'm willing to take a bet that they haven't yet been properly explored within government, in private within government either. And I think before these ideas go any further, before expectations are raised further, uh, we need to debate this idea very carefully, see what it means for us, see where it's going, see whether it's a good idea. I hope it's not too late to start that debate. It's certainly not too early. Let me start then just by looking at the at a couple of data points. And this is quite a complex thing. I'm going to try and do this very quickly, so I'm just going to touch on two. The first uh, sign of the sort of data point on the state of the, of, the, of the trajectory of the relationship is the existence of the two plus two um, uh, ministerial talks between the two countries in which as you probably know, the defence ministers and foreign ministers of the two countries meet simultaneously. Um, this is not a unique arrangement. Um, Australia does it with a number of countries and Japan does it with a number of countries. Um, but it is in itself, the fact that such discussions are taking place is itself a very vivid symbol of the uh, uh, demonstration of the fact that two countries believe, or at least they want to persuade others that they believe, that there's a very substantive strategic agenda to be discussed. But when you actually look at what's being said, and particularly when you look at the joint statement that emerged from this year's uh, 2 plus 2 a few months ago, um, the language itself, I think, is very telling. Now, I'm not normally uh, someone to pay a lot of attention to the joint statements that come out of um, meetings between ministers, uh, partly because I spent a fair bit of my career drafting them, and most of them are actually reasonably insignificant. But sometimes the words themselves or the context of the words carry real significance. I'm not going to read the whole thing out to you, but here are a few select phrases from the joint statement at this year's annual 2 plus 2 meeting between the Japanese and Australian Defence and Foreign Ministers that occurred, I think, in Perth earlier this year. Australia and Japan are natural strategic partners. Australia and Japan share a common strategic objective. To help achieve that objective, Australia and Japan are committed to working even more closely on security and defence matters in the following ways, including 
deepening exchanges and working together to strengthen regional cooperation on issues that have the potential to undermine the stability of the region. Issues that have the potential to undermine the stability of the region. And in a separate clause, ensuring mutual support for our respective alliances with the United States. Now, as I say, it's, it's possible to imagine language like that not meaning very much. That kind of language between Australia and New Zealand, for example, would be very unexceptionable. But three bits of context give it a great deal of significance. The first is, of course, the history of Japan's policy. Australians are very promiscuous when it comes to this kind of language. And indeed, we're rather promiscuous when it comes to alliances full stop. We're always pretty keen to say this sort of thing with other countries. Japan is not. Japan has adopted since 1945 a very virtuous policy of strategic monogamy. It has one partner and one partner only, and it never looks at another partner. For a long time, until very recently, the idea that Japan would develop a substantive strategic relationship with any country other than the United States was very strictly against very deeply held precepts of Japanese strategic policy. So this kind of language, for Japan to agree to this kind of language with a country other than the United States is a very big deal. I've done a little bit of research in the sort of language that's come out of the other sorts of dialogues that Japan has with other countries. And I reckon it's a pretty fair bet that that language, the kind of language I just read out excerpts from, is the strongest statement of alignment of strategic aims and objectives that Japan has made with any country other than the United States. So it's a very big deal from Japan's point of view. The second bit of context is, of course, the regional strategic setting. I'm not going to talk about this at length. Um, uh, some of you probably know what I'm going to say. Um, we are living in an era in Asia in which escalating strategic rivalry between the United States and China, uh, and more broadly questions about the way in which China's growing power is, fits into the, to the regional order and the changes that have to happen to the regional order in order to accommodate China's power is the principal strategic issue of our day. Um, and that at the moment, uh, those questions are giving rise to, I would say, a significantly and quite sharply escalating strategic rivalry between the US and China. Um, the Australian government um, is uh, in denial about this, I think. Um, uh, Indeed, if you look at the Asian Century white paper, um, it has the to me heroic sentence that we can be sure that the US and China aren't in strategic rivalry because they both say they're not. I don't think that quite takes the analysis far enough. In fact, I think the government knows perfectly well what's happening. They just don't want to acknowledge it because they're not quite sure what to do about it. Um, but it, in this context of escalating strategic rivalry in in the region between the US and China and in ways that I'll discuss in a minute, obviously very strongly involving Japan, this two plus two language that I've just mentioned clearly aligns Australia and Japan with the United States in the context of escalating rivalry and identifies our relationship, the Australia-Japan relationship, very much in support of the United States and essentially in support of the US pivot against China. Um, and the second bit of regional setting is, as I said, the actual evolution of the China-Japan relationship itself. And uh, uh, for, I think, reasons that go very deep to um, the essentially triangular nature of the US-China-Japan relationship, uh, as strategic rivalry between the US and China has escalated uh, uh, strategic tension between China and Japan has escalated uh, quite steadily for quite a long time and very sharply very recently. Um, and we only need to look at the Senkaku's uh, issue of the last um, a few months, uh, still I think unresolved, still I think very dangerous, to see how um, uh, what's at stake in 
in the regional context when Australia thinks about its relationship with Japan is not just how it plays into the US-China strategic rivalry, but how it plays directly into the Japan-China strategic relationship. And this is obviously an immensely significant issue from Australia's point of view. And the third bit of context that we need to take into account is the Japanese uh, domestic um, political situation. I'm a million miles from being an expert on Japanese domestic politics, um, but uh, it is clear that in what is anyway a very complex political situation in Japan right now, fascinatingly, on the, uh, being put to the test of an election, um, questions about how Japan defines its strategic role and, and strategic personality, so to speak, um, uh, in the face of the rise of China has become a really key issue, I, I would suspect. Uh, uh, it is a, there, are, there are more open questions about Japan's future strategic trajectory today than there have been for many decades. I think not necessarily since the Second World War, but I suspect uh, back until uh, something like the early 70s. And clearly, the very least you can say is that that means that the strategic personality of the Japan with which we'd be uh, with which we're building a closer relationship is at least uncertain and perhaps quite significantly unpredictable. So all of these suggest that the context in which Australia is building what I would say is a very rapidly developing relationship with Japan, the context in which we're, for example, using that kind of language, um, uh, the kind of language that was used in a joint statement, uh, both gives that language a great deal of significance and, and raises very significant questions about what that significance means for Australia. Um, uh, the second uh, sort of data point on the trajectory of the relationship is the way in which um, is the, the emerging role of Japan in our thinking about the future of our submarine capability. It's a very big subject in itself, but suffice to say that what had been until really very recently an almost unthinkable idea from both sides, that is that we would work closely together on a major capability project, has now become a clear possibility, something which both governments appear keen to promote. Um, and because of the sensitivity of submarine technologies in general, because of the centrality of submarine capability, the strategic thought, the operational posture of both countries, um, uh, the fact that uh, serious consideration has been given to significant cooperation in submarine capabilities is a very significant, seems to me to be a very significant indication of just how far and how fast this relationship is moving. Now the idea of a close defence relationship with Japan is not, a, is not a brand new one, it's certainly not invented by the Gillard government. In fact I think the historians will judge that the present trajectory began in a way in the early 1990s when Australian policy makers uh, started to ask how to best respond to the end of the Cold War recognising at the, at the end of the Cold War the question of relations between Asia's great powers, which had, particularly during the, in the post-Vietnam period in the, of the Cold War, the, the, the 70s and 80s, had really not been of much significance to Australia. We, we, we recognised reasonably early that, these, that the relationships between Asia's great powers, particularly in Northeast Asia, were going to become increasingly important. And one of the things Australian governments did in the early 90s was quite self-consciously say, OK, we've got to go out there and start building a stronger strategic dialogue with the countries of Northeast Asia to understand better where they're coming from. And although it wouldn't be true to say we're starting absolutely from scratch, uh, there, were, there had previously been relatively little going on either in our relations with Japan or Korea or China. It, it was quite an, a very interesting process in which I had the opportunity to play a very modest part. But what quickly emerged was that of those three countries, although there were very interesting things to talk about with all three of them, it did very quickly emerge, at least it certainly was my impression, but I think government's impression more broadly, was that uh, the relationship with Japan had the greatest natural fluency, if I can put it this way. There was the most to talk about, uh, the greatest natural convergence of perceptions and so on, and to a certain extent the greatest uh, willingness to really uh, explore questions. It was really a very satisfying process to be part of. Um, but there were clear limits on how far that was going to go, limits from the Australian side and, of course, very clear limits from the Japanese side, a great deal of resistance and hesitation to anything other than talking about broad questions rather than getting down into anything remotely practical, let alone anything that was resembling commitments. In fact, the idea of taking it further 
I think the historians will judge, started not with either, not either in Tokyo or in Canberra, but in Washington, as people at that stage outside the administration, in the what you might call a Republican opposition during the the, the um, Clinton administration, and particularly in the latter part of the 90s, started to ask themselves questions about what China's rise meant for the United States' position in Asia, questions which were actually quite a big issue in, in, in US strategic policy before 9-11 turned attention elsewhere. And a lot of people who later ended up being big figures in the, in the Bush administration came to the conclusion that in order to respond to China's growing power, the United States needed to build something that looked broadly like an Asian NATO and naturally looked towards looked to the established alliances as the foundation for that and naturally looked to Australia and Japan as two key players. And so in conversations in the as early as the late 90s, we started hearing from American friends and, and uh, colleagues the thought that maybe this pair of bilateral relationships needed to be multilateralised and maybe Australia needed to think, think hard about how to develop the Australia-Japan leg. At this, that was an idea which at that stage governments responded to very cautiously. Australian governments responded to very cautiously precisely because even then they saw that this would have an impact in Beijing and an impact that we wouldn't necessarily like. Um, and it was against that background that when the idea of the trilaterals was first established, the trilateral security dialogues which established uh, in 2001 or after 2001, initially at officials level, Australian governments were prepared to go along with them, but seemed to me at least to be notably cautious about them and remain notably cautious about them even when they were elevated to ministerial level in the middle of the decade. Um, in fact, the caution was only thrown to the winds, I think, in 2007, um, uh, after Kevin Rudd had become leader of the opposition in the long election campaign that led to the 2007 change of government in Australia. When John Howard, uh, having until then I think been very cautious about the US, ab about the relationship with Japan, precisely because of the optics elsewhere in Asia, despite being of course a very strong supporter of Japan and, and supporter of the broader relationship with Japan, suddenly forced the pace. Um, uh, early in the year he flew to Tokyo uh, to sign a, a, a modest substantively modest but symbolically very significant joint declaration on, um, on defence cooperation. And perhaps even more remarkable, in the process, on the way, he, um, uh, in a press conference, he said he'd be very happy that, that this, what we were going to sign today was not going to be an alliance, but he'd be very happy to think about an alliance sometime in the future. I think that was the first time any senior Australian government person had ever used the phrase alliance and Japan in the same sentence, intending to be linked together. Um, uh, and I think there was also, even by that stage, a lot of enthusiasm from the Japanese side. Um, Rudd was more cautious. Rudd's views of Japan itself is a very interesting question. But once Gillard came, uh, took over the prime ministership, uh, which of course coincided with a very significant further escalation of the strategic rivalry uh, in Asia, a further heightening of anxiety about China, a further deepening of anxiety in Japan, the trajectory towards expansion of the relationship grew very strongly. Um, now, that's not to say it's necessarily a bad idea. There are a lot of good reasons to build a close defence relationship with Japan. Uh, it is true that our values and our sense of politics and so on uh, align more closely with Japan's probably than with any other Asian neighbour. It is true that we have had a spectacularly successful economic relationship with Japan which has been of immense and immeasurable benefit to this country and it's not in the past tense. It remains a fantastically important economic relationship to Australia, one that's generally under underappreciated because we're focusing perhaps in some ways for understandable reasons, but nonetheless I think somewhat mistakenly so much on, on China. Or at least we, it, it, it mistakenly causes us to underestimate how significant the Japanese relationship is. But also, of course, it's not just economics. The relationship with Japan really has done what the diplomats always say they want bilateral relationships to do, and that is to, to turn into something much broader, with very deep links across the whole spectrum 
Um, it's a terrific relationship. I think you can say that in many ways Australia's relationship with Japan is the most successful relationship we've ever built in Asia. In some ways I think you can argue in terms of its significance to us as a country, the benefits it's given to us, the opportunities it's opened up for us has been the most successful relationship we have ever had with any country other than one or other of our great and powerful friends. It's a great relationship with a great country. And of course, it's a very powerful country. Japan has had a couple of very tough decades, but I've got to say my whole theory about the future of Asia strategically, uh, not undebated with some of my distinguished colleagues, I might say, is that Japan remains and will remain a great power in the Asian system. It's still got a huge economy. Um, it's got, and will have a very big economy for a very long time to come. It has phenomenal depth of technology um, and formidable organisational capacities and a great sense of itself as a country. And it also has great strategic geography. Uh, it's a very formidable country and if it chooses to use its strategic potential, it will be a very significant player in the Asian order, one way or the other. All of these are very good reasons to think that Japan would be a great strategic partner. But I still have my doubts. And in order to consider those doubts, I think the best thing to do is to turn the coin over and not look at it, the issue from Australia's side, but look at it from Japan's side. Why is Japan interested in a relationship with Australia? And I think in order to see that, you have to, we have to explain, we have to have a look at Japan's situation, what I'll call Japan's predicament, because it is a predicament. This is a big subject, I'm going to cover it very quickly. For Japan, the rise of China constitutes a very significant challenge to the strategic concept, construct that it built after the Second World War and which has served Japan so very well since then. The, the concept of, 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 so to speak, abrogating its inherent status as a great power and locating itself as a strategic client of the United States. This has been an exceptionally successful policy for Japan. But as China's power grows, I think it's become, becoming unviable certainly becoming very troubled. Japan genuinely fears uh, the way China will use its power uh, uh, as its power grows, uh, fears that China will use its power in ways that are contrary to Japan's uh, deeper interests. A and the Japanese have reason to fear that, it seems to me. I think China has done very little to reassure Japan, even less than, it, than China has done with the rest of us, to reassure Japan about how China would use its power in relation to Japan as that power grows. Uh, moreover, at the same time, Japan has, I think, become understandably, correctly, increasingly anxious about the extent to which it can rely on the United States to support it in the face of Chinese pressure. Uh, and the reason for that's very simple, that is, as China's power grows, China becomes both more important as a partner and more formidable as an adversary for the United States. <laughs> And, if the, and, and therefore the threshold for, for US support for Japan and an issue where, where Japan and China are in opposition gets higher. It costs America more to support Japan and therefore that threshold goes up. And uh, therefore the, 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 vibe, the, the, the principle upon which the viability of Japan's post-war posture is rested, that is the principle that Japan can always rely on the United States to put Japan's interests ahead of China's when they clash, becomes less and less credible. And I think Japan is groping for what to do in this predicament. And I think there are at least two ideas that kick around um, in what's yet, I think, still a very unformed debate in Japan. The first is to do whatever it can to bolster US support for Japan. And one of the ways one does that is, of course, to emphasise the adversarial relationship with China. The worse the US and China are getting on, the better Japan, the more Japan can rely on the United States providing support for, for, uh, for the United States providing support for Japan uh, when it clashes with China. And moreover, the more the US can be supported by others in the region, the bigger and denser the alliance network that supports the United States in its role in the Western Pacific, the more confident Japan can be. So Japan has an interest in to, to, to consolidate that position has an interest in pushing China away and pulling others in. And in that context, of course, Australia is quite a significant player. The second idea, 
I think less well formed even than the first one, is to just look forward to the thought, well, if, if, if America fails us, if America leaves, not this year or next year, maybe even not this decade or next decade, but looking further ahead, Japan will be looking to lead a coalition itself, seek support from others to resist Chinese hegemony, and that in such a coalition, Australia will be a valued partner. Now, if that's right, if that's a correct interpretation of Japan's predicament and a correct interpretation of the sorts of ideas that Japan is groping towards as it tries to think how to respond to that predicament, um, it does have very significant implications for what it means for Australia to come along. Japan is interested in Australia as a strategic partner to help it deal with China one way or the other. And that's how it's seen in Tokyo, and that's how it's seen in Washington, and that's how it's seen in Beijing, and I also think that's how it's seen in the rest of the region. We in Australia tend to see this as just something that's nice that's happening between two countries which have, lot, uh, which have a lot in common. What could be wrong with that? A little bit like the decision on the US Marines in Darwin was seen, I think, by the Australian government as just something nice that happened between two partners. What could be wrong with that? Just something between the two of us, none of anybody else's business. Well, no, that's not right. There's a regional setting. And in a regional setting, for Australia at this moment to be drawing so significantly close to Japan has very big implications for the way in which both of those countries play into that regional setting. Now, of course, there might be circumstances in Asia's future in which building an alliance with Japan on exactly that basis might actually be a smart thing to do. Circumstances in which China is overtly, aggressively trying to establish regional primacy. Um, in which containment of that ambition is the only credible option, with or without the United States. And if that was the case, then either way, a very close alliance with Japan would be uh, a very good thing because of its strength, its significance, the closeness of our interests and so on. But those circumstances are not there yet. And were they to arise, that would be a really desperate situation with immense costs. And for us to act now as if we were already in that situation would most certainly increase the likelihood we will end up in that situation and bring closer uh, precisely the kind of circumstances we're trying to avoid. There's a risk that it would become the only option, a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And for that reason, it's very dangerous to act as if that was already what we need to do before we need to. We've still got a chance of avoiding that vision of Asia's future. Uh, if we don't want to choose, and I am very much one of those who believes we shouldn't choose between the US and China if we can possibly avoid it. If we don't want to choose, then we have to focus on preserving a regional order in which those sorts of choices are not forced upon us. And the kind of policies which uh, uh, build a closer and closer defence relationship with Japan seem to me to make that kind of regional environment more likely and to raise the likelihood that Australia has to end up making the choices we don't want to make. Now that obviously pulls into a whole deeper, wider argument about Australia's view of its future in Asia, which I won't pursue here, which I have pursued elsewhere. Um, but let me just finish by saying that even leaving aside that very significant, I think centrally significant regional context. Let's just pull back and look at the, look at the alliance in its, uh, the, uh, in its own terms. Remember an alliance strictly conceived, if that is what we're thinking about, is in the end an agreement to go to war. The word is often used loosely, but we should use it quite strictly. An alliance is an agreement between two countries to go to war together in support of one another under certain circumstances, more or less well defined. So when we ask ourselves about the idea of an alliance with Japan, we need to ask ourselves this very simple question. Under what circumstances do we go to war to support Japan? And under what circumstances do they go to war to support us? And if anyone thinks those questions are hypothetical or fanciful, then they haven't understood the, the essential nature of an alliance. It's the way in which you answer those questions which gives meaning and content and substance to the alliance even when no war's on the horizon. Why is the Australia-US alliance so strong? Precisely because that we answer those questions, that pair of questions, 
in relation to those two countries in very specific, concrete ways. Whether or not an alliance with Japan makes sense depends critically on how we think those questions would, would be answered. This needn't take long. Would we go to war with China to support Japan over the Senkakus? I don't mean in some future Asian order in which we are already in a highly contested relationship, already in a Cold War, so to speak. I mean in Asia as it is today. Would we go to war with, with China to support Japan over the Senkakus? I think the answer is no. In the Asia of today, if we found ourselves in a conflict with Indonesia over West Papua, for example, separate issue but far from a hypothetical case, would Japan go to war with Indonesia to support us over West Papua? No. The fact is that for all the talk about values and so on, and I don't dismiss them, it's for real, I think that sort of the depth of that kind of connection with Japan is very significant, for all of that talk, in the end, such decisions reflect interests, not values. And our interests on those, in those situations are really quite different, partly because of the raw facts of geography. West Papua was close to us, and Kaku's are close to, part of, maybe, don't take a view on that issue, <laughs> Japan. Uh, and that the, the, the idea that we have the kind of alignment of strategic interests which would underpin that kind of commitment, I think is simply not supported by the facts. Likewise, we look about the question of submarines. Don't get me wrong, I have been for decades an immense fan of, this, of the Japanese submarine capability and the industry that supports it. It's just what I'd like for Australia, actually. Numbers are a bit small, but apart from that, um, it's just right. Continual build, two yards, you name it. It's just, it's just about my model. And the boats themselves are terrific. Um, but the idea of Australia uh, entering into a close partnership with Japan on submarine capability seems to me to carry two very <coughs> high costs for us. The first is the message that itself would send to China about our alignment with Japan. And the increased risk of escalating strategic rivalry that would bring. But secondly, more broadly, the extent to which we would then be entrusting the viability of our, one of our, or I would say perhaps our most important capability, to uh, the relationship with Japan in a way which uh, would uh, significantly list, limit our freedom to manoeuvre um, and uh, undermine the, our, our capacity to, to maintain that capability independently and to make independent decisions about how we were going to use it. We've often wrestled with this question in relation to the United States. How much more would we need to wrestle with it in relation to Japan? To me, one of the great advantages of European suppliers for submarine technology is simply that because they're further away, they're just less likely to be involved in whatever issues are so important to us, whereas I think the chances of Japan not being involved one way or another in the issues we're involved in is very high. So let me finish. It's no doubt at all that um, our relationship with Japan is an immensely important one and will remain so. And there's no doubt at all that that, 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 that relationship could and should develop, include a significant strategic component. Strategic affairs in this region are very complicated. Japan is a very significant player. It's a player whose interests are likely to align, align with ours in many circumstances. I think building a relationship in which you explain those things, explore those things, is, ex is extremely important, absolutely justified. So building that real strategic rapport, I think, is a really good idea. But that rapport has to, has to be built on and the limits to it have to reflect a genuine and honest understanding of where Japan's policies are going, where Australia's policies are going, what our genuine interests are, where they coincide, and where they may diverge. And it has to be conservative about the extent to which they might diverge in future. Um, I think we just have to be very careful as a country and not very experienced country in this tough business not to be too naive about this. We need to recognise how anything we do with Japan plays into a very complex and dangerous rebalancing of, a stream of strategic alignments in Asia especially between the major powers, and recognise how, in the end, Japan's interests in this are not going to be the same as ours. Quite a few years ago now, a very distinguished 
Japanese official, friend and colleague, said to me, talking about all of this, he said, Hugh, you've got to understand something very simple. For us, US-China rapprochement is a nightmare. For you, it's a dream. I think that's a profound truth. Thank you very much. Starts like that, he's always going to ask a real crackerjack question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, it's, a, it's a very interesting thesis you present, um, and I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of the strategic policy makers who've thought about this and who are going along with it yeah, yes. in, in um, Russell, yes. um, <laughs> and thinking about what 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 they are possibly, you know, ticking over in their minds as this is happening. My, my sense is that um, they are probably are thinking um, that the premise that further or increased cooperation or an alliance with Japan would heighten tensions um, uh, is not necessarily all that uh, one that it's not necessarily one they, they, they agree with, yeah. um, and perhaps they are thinking that the opposite is true, and that in fact if Australia asserts itself early on, before things get too, uh, uh, before the temperature gets too hot, that in fact it will have uh, a um, positive effect in terms of, uh, or, or a negative effect if you like, in terms of uh, Chinese uh, assertiveness over uh, these grey areas in the South China Sea and Senkaku Jiayu Islands, etc. Um, and so that, that, that's probably one of their thinking. Yeah. And the other, the other thought I had was, well, maybe, uh, particularly in terms of the US alliance, I don't get that uh, the Senkakus are seen by the, Ameri is, uh, by the Americans as a uh, this line, cross this line, and we're at war type thing. So if Japan goes to war over, or has a spat with China over the Senkaku Jiayu Islands, mm. I don't get that the Americans would use that as a casus belli. Yeah. You know. yeah. uh, they might give them intelligence support, but a bit like the Brits in the Falklands, yeah. say, ah, yeah. that's your that's your show, baby. Yeah. We're not going there. You know. Yeah. Um, so if that's right, then maybe the position that we're seeing is actually a bit more reasonable. Yeah. Than the yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, look, very good, very good question and very good methodology, if you know what I mean. It's always a good idea. When you see someone doing something you think is dumb, you, must, you ask yourself the question, well, what must they think to make that look smart? Because you don't want to assume that people are stupid. Um, however, having said that, uh, I think you're right, actually, in the way you frame the first part of your question. I'll come to the second part of your question later. The, 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 you're right in the way you frame the first part of the question. Uh, this policy only looks smart if you can be persuaded that, um, amongst other things, uh, that uh, uh, building a closer defence relationship with Japan is likely to defuse rather than escalate um, uh, the sort of emerging sort of division of the Western Pacific into camps, you know, China on the one hand and the US-led coalition on the other. Um, and then they might believe that. I, I, think, I think, though, that I'd, I'd, I just want to know where the data was to support that. I think they might hope it, but hope is not a strategy. Uh, you want to have some evidence that there's actually some reason to think that mechanism is going to work, and I think all the evidence, plus a kind of what you might call intuitive um, kiss and cherry and common sense, if I can put it that way, just suggest, no, that's not the way they're going to respond. Um, they're going to see people gang up against them. And, you know, partly because they've told us. Um, so I think you know it's 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 it's, it's possible. I think that uh, I, I can't see how that how how that judgment would be sufficiently robustly based. Uh, moreover, I think 
th there is an alternative explanation. Um, and that is that um, in the end, you know, uh, it's, one knows how this happens. Um, you know, your policy is set, directions are going along, there's a government that is very reluctant to acknowledge, I think even to itself, um, that there really is escalating strategic rivalry in the Asia Pacific. Um, because, precisely because of the policy challenges that poses Australia in all sorts of levels. And, whilst, and, and while you're in denial about that, it's very easy to think that just building nice, neat bilateral relationships is, what, what harm is there in that? And partly, of course, because we have quite a few decades where in the absence of serious strategic competition between Asia's great powers, it has been possible to build bilateral relationships with a whole lot of different countries without interfering. You know, we built a terrific bilateral relationship with defence relationship with Indonesia and a terrific bilateral defence relationship with Singapore, a terrific bilateral defence relationship with well, every country in Southeast Asia, actually. And none of them inter ever interfered with one another. People used to ask, you know, I was in, the business, in that business, people used to say, don't these interfere with one another? No, you really can do all of this at once. But now it's different because we are now in an era of strategic rivalry. So I think there's some, some laziness and some old fashioned thinking and some reluctance to face reality, um, which I think is a more likely explanation that they've just than the one you suggest. Uh, I, I'd be very glad to be proved wrong. Um, uh, sorry, the second part of your question I've just forgotten. Oh, yes. Um, absolutely. No, very important point. Um, well, uh, this would be more a question to put to the Japanese and the Americans than to me, but let me just offer you my very clear view. And that is that what will make a US, a China, Japan clash over the Senkakus, an, ex uh, an exceptionally serious strategic crisis, was because I think the Japanese would very strongly and I think very naturally regard it as a test of America's willingness to support them against China. Um, and so at, a, at an early stage of such a crisis, they would seek absolutely unambiguous statements of US support, including US willingness to use all the instruments of American power. And an American failure to do that would be seen in Tokyo and would be recognised in Washington as very seriously damaging the US-Japan alliance. And that, of course, has immense implications for Japan. I mean, one doesn't want to over-dramatise these things, but alliances don't last forever, and it's things like that, that that destroy them. But it would also have very significant implications in Washington, because if they lose Japan as an ally, then uh, their status as the, as, as the primary power in the Western Pacific is already, well, very significantly dented. So I, I think what makes, I mean, I, I, think, I do think the Senkaku issue is, is, is an exceptionally dangerous one. Um, got to be very careful not to overwork this metaphor, but you don't want to ignore it. Uh, it's, it is, has a kind of a whiff of Sarajevo about it. Um, uh, because, uh, precisely because it is, a, it is a classic example of an issue in which um, Japanese anxieties, which I stress are entirely, to my mind, understandable. I would share those anxieties. If, if, uh, near 1914, that's right, thank you. Um, uh, 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 the, um, uh, the, uh, the anxieties that Japan has seems to me to be absolutely, you know, laid bare. Um, and so, in fact, I think it would be exceptionally hard for the United States not to get involved. And I think that is actually a pretty widely held view in the United States. So you then assume that they'll use their support? I think they would. Um, and I think it would, the consequences would likely be disastrous. Um. Um, I first would like to appreciate uh, Hugh's uh, contribution uh, to this. And um, I've been here as a Japanese diplomat for three years now. And uh, what I've been doing, trying to do is to, to help Australian audience, people, or students, or academia, understand uh, not what shows, of course, uh, how important it is uh, strategic relations between Australia and, and Japan. And you did it in, in 20 minutes. <laughs> so oh, we, I particularly appreciate your, your contribution to that. Having said that, uh, uh, rather than a question, uh, I'd like to, to raise uh, one important factual point, 
you you said you indicated that there is a there is a leeway. Uh, I mean, um, um, both Australia and Japanese officials uh, now aiming at uh, uh, going into to strategic alliance, uh, legal pact between the two countries. But so far as I know, there's no such uh, intention on neither side. Maybe you should ask uh, any defense official or debate official or who might be here. But as far as I know, that's not our intention to, to go into defense alliance. Because uh, um, for us at least, it's impossible to make a legal alliance. Uh, you, you raise this issue of uh, whether uh, Japan can go to war uh, over, say, West Papua or, or whatever in the region. But uh, uh, even in the defense pact with, uh, with the U.S., it's not uh, envisaged that Japan goes to war mm -hmm. to, to protect the U.S. Uh, interests, say, in Hawaii, Guam, or even in California. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's quite unilateral, yeah. as you yeah, yes, right. right. mentioned. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's not the intention of the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, U.S.-Japan alliance uh, 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 is uh, more or less uh, to, to <coughs> protect the Japanese sovereignty, uh, national interest, and in the background of the uh, Cold War, maybe to, to have a certain, um, um, I forget the word, uh, US uh, uh, front forwarding uh, strategy in, in terms of uh, uh, confrontation with, with uh, uh, then uh, Eastern alliance. Uh, but nowadays, I really change to to uh, to see more regional security stability type of uh, um, um, goal to be achieved through to this alliance, and uh, to 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 achieve the same uh, uh, goal, uh, neither Australia or Japan uh, is thinking that we need to sign a pact. To, to form an alliance, but rather uh, through, uh, through continuous uh, uh, exchange of views, including two plus two you mentioned, uh, to share views and uh, uh, collect uh, exchange information, including intelligence maybe, uh, to, to, to find out the way uh, how uh, Australia and, and Japan commonly uh, contribute to the stability. We are not aiming at, uh, uh, say, containing China uh, in, in, in the issue of uh, Senkaku Islands or, or to, to fight against, say, a ROK over uh, Takeshima Island. Uh, it's not our intention. Uh, so uh, I, I, I tend to find <coughs> out uh, some logical way between your uh, uh, Explanation of uh, the, the history of uh, uh, Australia Japan Japan's uh, strategic partnership and the future alliance uh, in view of uh, China's uh, uh, uprising. That's my comment. Good. Thank, thank you very much. A very, a, a very welcome contribution, and thank you for participating in this uh, discussion. I really appreciate that. Um, let me make a couple of points. The first is uh, I'm absolutely sure you're right that there is no um, formal proposal now on the table. I'm sure that, I don't know, I'm not absolutely sure that's true. I, I, I'm sure it's true if you say it is. Um, but I, I have no evidence, even apart from that, there's any formal proposal on the table. So my, my thought about that is a reflection of a series of, uh, of informal conversations that I've had with others about informal conversations that they've had, possibly about informal conversations that they've had. But by the nature of my business, I do have to start thinking about possibilities before they get to the point of being, you know, real things. I, I, it, it seems to me, I, I absolutely accept your point, but it seems to me that on both sides, at both, you know, north and south of this axis, there has been some quite, in some ways, as I say, new ideas are very rare in our business, so quite new ideas, you know, whoa, and, and I, 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 don't, I, I don't actually resist the idea that new ideas should be thought, I just think people should think them through more, uh, uh, very carefully. So I quite take a point, there's nothing uh, specific and concrete on the, on the table. My point is rather this is a sort of way in which people are speculating about where the, where the relationship might go. The second point, of course, is that, absolutely as you say, 
this would, from the Japanese end, be quite unthinkable in the present framework, now very durable framework, of Japan's strategic posture and and perhaps arguably even in some aspects of its law, certainly it was very well established um, strategic sort of policies and precepts. And so this would presuppose a change in some of those. Um, but that is after all perhaps less unthinkable now than it has been in even the quite recent past. Um, you know, I think of, of uh, how far the conversations have got already about the fact that Japan has at least somewhat, I understand, eased the uh, formerly very strict um, limits on um, prescription of, um, of uh, exports of military material. Um, that Japan, I, as I understand it, is, is reconsidering the question as to um, how far it goes to support the United States in the region beyond the defence of Japan's own islands. All of these are, as I say, if I was a Japanese policymaker or analyst, I'd be pursuing exactly the same issues in Japan's strategic situation. I think, as I say, I have a great deal of sympathy for the situation that Japan finds itself in. So you're right, of course, it would require a very different set of policy precepts in Japan, but it does seem to me that the possibility that Japanese policy might evolve in exactly that direction is, is at least there. And, um, you know, from the depths of my ignorance about the fascinating but bewildering and intricacies of Japanese domestic politics, it seems to me that nothing that's happening in Japan politically at the moment makes it less likely that things could emerge, governments could emerge in which uh, such policy changes could take place. Um, and the third point is to, is to say that, you know, and I, I guess it's a point that I should have made because it's a very important one, and that is n nothing in the arguments I'm making about the trajectory of Japanese strategic policy um, uh, is, is to me is a criticism of the way Japan is handling its present predicament, if I can put it that way. I do think it's a predicament. I think it's a very difficult situation. Um, I think it's a situation that's arisen through no fault of Japan's. Um, uh, I, I, I completely understand the position that Japan finds itself in. Um, I'm not sure that uh, that I, I'm not sure that the approach Japan is taking is necessarily the best one, uh, but um, but there are no easy ones. And uh, elsewhere in other arguments I've presented and written, um, I've come up with the uh, unhelpful suggestion that the best solution for Japan to this predicament is to cease to be a strategic client of the United States and to re-emerge in Asia as an independent strategic power. I actually think. It's a separate argument, which I won't rehearse here, but I actually think that it will be very difficult for a stable US-China relationship to evolve, and therefore very difficult for a stable Asia to evolve, um, as long as Japan continues to be dependent on the United States that it can never quite trust as China's power grows. And that I, for one, think that um, uh, 70 years or whatever it is after the end of the Second World War, uh, it's time for Japan to be a great power again. Now, I know that's an idea that has people in Japan <laughs> view with very mixed blessing views, and that's partly because the, the status quo or their previous posture has been so successful in Japan. And if I was Japanese, I'd have had a very strong view that it has worked for Japan hitherto, but it's going to cease to work in future. So the fact that I'm raising these concerns from an Australian point of view doesn't, think I, doesn't mean I think Japan is, is necessarily doing the wrong thing, and uh, I actually think Japan is anyway going to have to rethink things very carefully. I just think it's not going to be helpful actually to Japan or for Australia for us to try and build the relationship as close as some people are speculating it might go. Right, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, going back to the first question about the Zimbabwe Islands, you created the scenario that on the balance of probability the United States would probably support Japan in the conflict with China over those islands. So using standard American theory, they would then probably start contacting their other allies and partners in the region, which ultimately would probably end up with a phone call to Canberra. So <laughs> to take that scenario, what is better? Australia is defining its own destiny by determining the terms of its Japan, which would be that same activity, or coming up with a very creative answer to that phone call that doesn't in some way damage our relationship with the United States? Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, uh, well, the first, the sort of point of, of uh, prediction or analysis, uh, I think the chances of Australia getting the phone call 
from Washington under the present situation is very high. Um, uh, put it this way, if, if, I, if I was in the Pentagon, I'd, I'd, I'd be telling the White House to make the call. I mean, you know, apart from anything else, they've, you know, they've got on the net and they've uh, Googled the cop, uh, ANZUS and have discovered what Article 4 says. <laughs> and, you know, roughly speaking, give or take a bit of a quibble about what counts as in the Pacific area and one thing and another, the ANZUS Treaty says we will act to meet the common danger in accordance with our constitutional processes. So, no, no, I, th I, think, I, I think we are, uh, we are clearly uh, going to get the call. I, I'm about as confident of that as I can be, of such things. If, if, if the United States finds itself drawn into supporting Japan, it will seek support of others, and I think Australia will be right at the top of the calling list. Um, uh, and, if, and you're right, there's, a, there's an, it's an elegant thought that it might actually be better for Australia to frame its uh, a decision about that is a decision to support Japan rather than a decision to support the United States. Um, but frankly, both of them are appalling outcomes. And um, uh, there is a third option. And I think the third option is for us to say no in that case. Now, whether we would or not, I, I, I don't know. That is actually, it's a very interesting question. One of the reasons, one of the things that bears on that, one of the reasons it makes it so hard is that um, as soon as that question is asked, as soon as that situation's arisen, then we're already in a different world. If we ask ourselves how do we respond in a, it, it, you know, today, the way the world is today, um, the answer would be probably no, why would we want to do that? And I think that would be the intuitive instinct of even very strongly alliance-oriented members of the government. On a relatively few occasions when I've had the opportunity to test the, so to speak, strategic instincts of um, Australian political leaders of both sides of politics about their response to such a, that kind of scenario, not necessarily in relation to St Kaku, but you know, in relation to situations like Taiwan, I've m more often, I've, m I've, I've been, almost invariably been surprised by how few people want to say yes uh, to support the United States. Um, so I think there will be a great deal of reluctance. But then once you're in that situation, in a sense, you're already in a different world and you have to sort of re re rethink things from the ground up. So I'm not sure exactly what answer we give, but I think in the end it wouldn't make much difference to us the depth of the tragedy we'd be involved in, whether we're responding to the United States or responding to Japan. And in the end, um, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna court the support of one power or another in that world, you might as well court the support of the one that's already got the nuclear weapons. Partnership, I think we're already in that situation, and that started 20 years ago, you recall, when we had talks in Tokyo. I think where you're correct is what could bring this on is, to use an old fashioned phrase, Chinese Bolshevism pushing their weight around, and they're getting very close to it. They're getting very close to it in the South China Sea, and they're getting very close to it in their words and language in, on the Senkakus. And when we have a visiting Chinese general, Using words down in Melbourne. Mm, yes, no, I, no, I paid. Yeah, you no, know, I paid careful attention to that. Yeah, yeah. 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 For twenty years, very slowly, very gradually. Yes, it's getting some momentum, but not as dramatic as I think you're suggesting. We have a limited logistics supply, supply and resupply agreement. We have an extremely limited information sharing, for which we need intelligence relationship. But is Japan a part of the Four Eyes Club and is it likely to become so? No. Final quick point. Hugh, rest assured I am extremely well informed where we are going and not going with submarines. <laughs> extremely well informed. And we are not going to buy them from Japan and Japan is not going to sell them. We are interested in the diesel uh, engine technology and propulsion and I think unless Minister Mori disagrees with me, even that for that, for Japan to export with their slightly modified rules is going to be a problem. So the most we're probably going to do is talk about uh, technological adv ad advice. And the final, final point is, whatever submarine we buy, let me say absolutely clearly, we'll have the Virginia-class nuclear attack submarine combat system on board, as the Collins does, and the American weapon systems like the ADCAP-48 torpedo half boom and God help us all, Tomahawk. 
and how we integrate that into a foreign designed and built hull will be an extremely sensitive subject which will deal certain countries and certain some European ones out. Well, I'm reassured by parts of that. <laughs> um, look, but, but ser seriously, um, uh, I mean, I, you see, I go a bit further than you do. Um, I don't think the Chinese are close to challenging. They are challenging. They're challenging the status quo in Asia. Of, of course they are. They're not going to accept as their economy approaches in Americas um, uh, the power relationship which they accepted in 1972. Now, we can regret that, but we can't be surprised by it. And the question is how best to respond to it. And, well, that's the, that's the subject in which, subject for a different discussion. Um, uh, but, but what, you know, in a sense, my core message is the way we think about the development of our relationship with Japan is intimately connected with that. Uh, secondly, of course, I quite take your point that if you, uh, you know, that so, so far, and partly because of the constraints of, you know, existing Japanese policy, as, uh, as Minister Mori pointed out, we have, um, you know, some, I think, quite valuable, but not very valuable, but necessarily quite limited uh, practical things. What strikes me, though, is that the tone of ambition uh, which has crept into the discussion of the relationship in government circles, I think at both ends, in the last two years, certainly, has become notably, you know, notably much higher. And the third point to say is anything to get rid of those bloody Hedamora diesels would be a great reassurance to me, and I have the utmost respect for a Japanese diesel propulsion, propulsion system, and I'd like nothing better to see those diesels in our boats. Um, that would be a very satisfactory outcome. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not prejudiced against German diesels either. I just, I just don't want any more bus, bus engines, please. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, part of a different discussion. Um, but, uh, and I do, and just to be clear, I do think there is scope for significant cooperation with Japan on that. But the, the point I'm making uh, there is that we need as we develop cooperation with Japan on capabilities like submarines to be very attentive both to the strategic optics because it, 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 it does have implications for the way in which uh, we are seen um, elsewhere in the region, including in China, and we can't ignore those, those optics. Don't, that does not say we always have to respond to them, but we have to know what they are. And secondly, to ensuring, as we would in all capability choices, maximising our independence and flexibility. Um, and I think at that level, that kind of level of, uh, of engagement, there's quite a lot uh, of, uh, of opportunity. But you would be aware that some people in the debate have been talking much more ambitiously or much more freely about what the relationship with Japan might, uh, might, might deliver. And it's uh, to those propositions that I'm directing my remarks. All right, I think we might have to call a wrap to it there. Um, I'd like to invite Professor Brendan Taylor, the head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, to give the voice of thanks. <coughs> well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, um, Andrew, and thank you especially to, uh, to Hugh. Uh, those of you who, who know Hugh will, will know that this year um, he's been away, for part of the year anyway, in, enjoying um, the, the modern day version of what was formerly known as, as uh, sabbatical, that, that kind of uh, fine academic tradition where every seven years or so uh, an academic uh, scholar takes some time out to, uh, uh, to, um, to study, to, to travel a bit and, uh, and ideally to, to rest a bit uh, also. But um, Hugh, I certainly hope you've been able to enjoy the, the study and the, uh, the travel aspects. Um, I'm yet to be convinced that you've taken much uh, rest because it certainly has been a, an extraordinarily uh, big and, and busy year for you. We've, we've seen you uh, launch um, China Choice and it's been wonderful uh, to see uh, the, the very big splash that that book has made, not only uh, nationally but also um, internationally as well, and, and the traction that, that some of those arguments are, are getting. Um, but you've also opened the debate and taken in the debate in, in new and very interesting directions. I, I look back on the year and, and think about your, your work on, on Indonesia and, and looking at the implications for, for Australia of Indonesia's growing economic and strategic weight, and, and this evening um, also with your um, interrogation of the, the evolving uh, strategic relationship between uh, Australia and Japan. So, uh, certainly thank you so much for continuing to push the debate, for 
continuing in, in, uh, in some instances to provoke us, um, but I think in, in all instances, I think to, uh, to inspire us and, and to stimulate us all uh, in our own work. So thank you very much for that. Just before we do close, I'd um, also like to uh, single out a, a very big vote of thanks to, to Andrew Carr. Um, Andrew joined um, our centre at the beginning of this year. He's been a really wonderful uh, addition to the team. He's been uh, running around, um, keeping up with Hugh and, and our other colleagues and, uh, and really promoting um, our outreach um, efforts. And certainly the Centre of Gravity uh, series, Andrew, thank you for all the work that you've put uh, into that. It's a real credit uh, to you and I look forward to, to many more of these coming out uh, next year and making a similarly big uh, impact. And last but not least, I know it's a very busy time of year, but I just wanted to say a quick thanks to, to all of you for, uh, for turning up tonight, um, to our um, colleagues from the Japan Institute who have uh, co-hosted the event uh, with us this evening and certainly helped with the, uh, um, the, the advertising. Uh, I certainly hope that, uh, that all of you here have found this an enjoyable evening, that you enjoy and find our, our new Centre of Gravity series uh, useful. Uh, just in case you, you don't, though, we, we have um, put on some drinks afterwards, so at least you can enjoy those if, uh, if nothing else. So uh, thanks very much for your support uh, throughout the year and um, look forward to seeing you all again uh, next year. And if you join us, man, giving Hugh a big, very vote of thanks to tonight. <laughs>